I, uh, I picked up salt uh, almost a year ago uh, from an existing installation and it had a number of deficiencies that I wanted to address. Uh, I had just come from another environment where we had some of the same elements, but we were using Puppet for config management, and I learned why I don't like Puppet. Uh, so what I'm hoping to cover here today is, uh, first off, kind of the philosophy behind separating concerns between config management and deployment auto automation. Uh, it is very tempting sometimes to do all your automation with SALT, and I'm just going to go ahead and say I'm not into that. Uh, SALT does a lot of really great stuff, and I love the stuff it does, but some things are best handed over to another tool. Uh, I'm hoping to show some of the methods I've done this, I, I've used in doing this, uh, particularly in how to manage multiple different environments with the same uh, artifacts and code bases. And this is going to involve uh, demonstrating what I've done with salt mine and really to get the most out of what I am covering here uh, you will need some basic understanding of salt or a working salt system uh, to apply this to. So this all starts with the D we have applications we have written them and sometimes, you know, it's very easy to trivialize. You write an application, and you decide, I am going to put this on a server. And then everybody laughs because, you know, you thought it was going to be easy. But it's not easy. Uh, or at least, sometimes there's enough magic that makes it easy, but even then, sometimes the magic runs out. And you need to understand the magic you're using so that it doesn't completely blow up in your face. And you need robots to uh, keep track of all the moving parts. So uh, kind of the elements I break things down to and that I think of things in are uh, we've got artifacts, which are it's your application code base packaged at a particular point in time. Uh, my artifacts all have a uh, get commit hash as part of the version number. There's config management, which is the salt part where you're laying down all of your dependencies, and deployment automation, uh, which is what we will be talking about with Jenkins. Uh, but I divide things along these lines just as a way of thinking about them. Uh, and whenever I divide them this way, it is config management is the stuff that is always going to be the same from app version to app version, and deployment management is all the stuff that you need to change at the time of a deploy, and that you need to be able to roll back to in an instant. So artifacts, uh, pretty straightforward. In my case, uh, and in my demo here, I have a, uh, a Python app with a setup pi that gets packaged up. And it's actually the, uh, the pip installable artifact that is my artifact. With the, uh, the salt side, I maintain a lot of information. Uh, I use grains to track what apps should be installed where. I use it to make sure that I have unified logins everywhere. Uh, I set up the special users that the applications are going to run as install dependencies, all the things that usually require pseudo access if you're using another tool uh, such as Fabric or something like that. So I, I kind of reduce the need for some of the features of Fabric by shifting that over to Salt. And uh, finally, I generate all my config files uh, using the environment information. To feed the information that I need to build all these configurations, I actually I set grains on each of the machines. Uh, I have a grain named environment and a grain named role or roles, and the roles is a list of every application role that I have in my environment. Uh, so, for example, in this uh, configuration set that you can go look at, uh, there is 
the uh, load balancer and the MES app. Uh, the application is it's a mezzanine application. Uh, mezzanine is a blog piece of blog software written in Python. And uh, another example I've presented is uh, pseudo groups, which you can actually set groups of users that have passwordless pseudo access to your machines. Uh, that's one I particularly make use of in staging environments where I don't really feel like my security requirements are that high, and I just want to let people pseudo to get what they need done. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff I do with grains. In my environments, I also put in some per host configuration modifications, like uh, the number of micro WSGI workers that I need to start when I'm running micro WSGI. Uh, that is just put in a grain. In my, when I'm building my config, I try to pull that out of the grain, or I just default to some value I have there in the config file. The real magic uh, is really found in the salt mine. And the salt mine was something that I was Googling around and ran across and was a little bit sad at, like, the official documentation was a little bit light. I found some examples, and I really expanded from there. And I was really sad when the release in July broke some of what I am using for salt mining uh, for about six months until the next major release came out. It was very unfortunate. Uh, but using salt mine, I'm able to query for all of the hosts that have a particular role assigned in a particular environment. Uh, when we get looking at the config, we'll be able to see that, particularly in the HA proxy. Uh, but it's also very handy for figuring out exactly where your MongoDB servers are or any of that stuff. Uh, also, RabbitMQ servers are all very easy to find using these methods. Yes? It is a part of salt. Uh, you can, in your pillars, define a uh, series of commands that all the minions are supposed to run on an interval. And then those commands will populate the salt mine with data. And then you can use uh, mine.get in your templates to query that data using selectors that are formatted pretty much the same way as your command line salt selectors. And then what they return is a dictionary that is the uh, machine's host name and the return value of whatever that function that was configured had. So is this any different than just asking your minions a state that the state that they're in? Or? This, so the salt mine is gathering, is from one minion gathering information about other minions. Oh, okay. So that, that's where it's really kind of different. And it also slows down your salt run slightly. That your salt runs slightly. I mean, it's transacting a lot of information, trying to gather up all the information you've asked for. And so when you have extensive use of that, you know, it can drive it up to like 30 seconds or so. Okay. You know, okay. still a far cry from the three minute puppet runs I had. It, may, it makes that data queryable so that you can come up with lists of things that you want. And then with those lists comes details about them that you can then pull stuff out. But we will get deeper into that. So uh, that's a mining for your environment information. I also, uh, I also gather up information using this feature uh, to create an environment map so that I generate a series of static HTML pages that will show you exactly uh, what services are running on which machines and give you links either to admin interfaces or just to the actual running server. So uh, deployment automation. We've configured up a machine. Uh, what we're hoping to get out of deployment automation is uh, completely repeatable results. If you know that your config has been managed and all your config files for your app are consistent, uh, when, you when you use your deployment automation, you want to know that when you put down one artifact, it will be put down exactly the same way every time. Uh, 
and you want to be able to have tools to just hand that off to anyone. Uh, where I work, we actually, uh, this is all baked down to the level of a Jenkins job, so nobody actually has to really know what's going on on the server to run it. They just need to know where the Jenkins job is and how to select the exact version of the app that they have recently built. So I'm actually going to move a little quicker over this part. Uh, in essence, uh, we're going to cover this. We copy the file to the host, create a new virtual env, pip install the artifact, uh, at least in my Python environment. And we uh, SSH through all the hosts again and finish whatever deploy steps were necessary, running collect static since it's a Django app, and uh, running any migrations that need to occur, or at least in a post Django 1.7 world, uh, and restart application servers. So this is the part where I would like to kind of go through all the stuff that we've got. Uh, I have these links here and a compulsive desire to use a mouse that is not connected to my computer. So uh, first we'll hit up Jenkins. And yes, I was too cheap to buy a cert for this. But everything that I'm doing is in the uh, ow2015.stormsherpa.com domain. So I've got my Jenkins server. And uh, there's basically a, a actually let me make sure I'm doing this in the right order. All right. Uh, I do want to make sure that I Open this up first. Uh, Is there any documentation going through structures between <coughs> minions, grains, pillars, library after that uh, you've got up on your blog at this point? I have a full repo of my working config. Okay. Uh, and I would invite everyone to go to stormsherper.com and actually pull up that blog post and follow some of the links because that will uh, be the quickest way to find the things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, in the setup folder in the salt stack repo, I've actually put in a number of things, uh, including the config XML files for Jenkins for the uh, deploy mesapp and mesapp config jobs. I wanted to uh, include those because the actual job configuration is a little bit involved. Uh, I'm making use of some nice modules, like uh, I want to say one of them is the oh, what's it called? There's a uh, yeah, the extended choice parameter plug in for Jenkins. Uh, what it allows me to do is it allows me to write out files in the file system that Jenkins is then able to read in and oops, and uh, turn into handy drop-down boxes. So the uh, artifact selection drop-downs are all driven by configuration files that are laid down either by Salt or by Jenkins. So I don't have to keep going into all of my Jenkins jobs and updating my list of environments. So uh, the scripts also for this are uh, text files. So you have available to you the uh, full text of my deploy script, which uh, uses the find artifacts uh, script that I've written and also included to go searching through the uh, Jenkins uh, artifact uh, artifacts that have been saved as part of the build jobs and fetch the exact file that you want to deploy 
and then go through the various steps that I talked about. So we have the uh, we SSH over, cat the file in to the environment. We then SSH back in, create a virtual lamp, which is based off of the commit hash, install into it, uh, symlink it, all the steps that I was talking about a few minutes ago. But all the source is there. And with Jenkins, we have a nice, uh, a nice way of say, being able to express the variable name and exactly what file and key in the property file is going to be used to come up with the list of options. Now the primary offshoot of this is when it comes time to uh, build the app or deploy the app, we can simply grab an artifact that's been created, an environment, and away it goes. And since this one's already been deployed in that environment, it's going to make sure that everything is installed, run through the... It's not doing config stuff. The config stuff is already done. I, uh, so it's just plain code. Right. The config management is only refreshed when I have, when I know that something has changed that needs to be modified on the servers. Uh, I'm not really a fan of just scheduling your config management to kick off at an, an interval because you never really know if something has changed in your config management setup that might impact an environment. So you uh, proceed with caution, or you deserve everything you get when your stuff turns off. Is there a login we can use to see your uh, Jenkins configs? Uh, let me. I, I didn't want to change it. Well, I do have a backup of them, so I'm going to. Uh, kind of put on my cowboy hat and give everyone else access to shoot me in the foot. So please don't. But this is an entirely disposable setup, so I could cope if it did get trashed. Let's see. Sure. All right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are interested, you can now view these configurations. So I'd like to move on to uh, pointing out the salt stuff. Like the actual salt config, there were a few interesting points that I wanted to hit. The first one is my pillars. Uh, for every environment, I have an SLS file that gives me some set of definitions. Uh, here I've got a, uh, a section for MESAP, which is my application. When I have multiple applications, I have a section per application. Uh, but I all I put it all just in a dictionary tree. So uh, I didn't want to commit any of my AWS keys directly into this configuration, so I uh, made them configurable on a local machine. Usually, though, I just directly put my keys in this file because this is usually a very private repo. Uh, my S3 configuration file, we'll actually see in the local settings file how that gets processed and then my database settings. So uh, each environment has a very similar file.
slightly more stripped down one for uh, for my staging environment. I've got it just directing to a local host since it's a uh, single node environment. But if we come back here, come on packets. We crack open the uh, init SLS. Kind of the magic of how this gets loaded into my environment is right here. Because I'm making use of the grain named environment. And uh, I use the include method to include environment dot whatever the environment is, environment name is, to load that file in. And I load it under the key environment. So this makes it so that I'm able to query uh, pillar for the value environment and just have access to that whole dictionary tree. And then, of course, I also set up uh, my mine so that my salt mine will have a value I can query for called network.ip adders. Uh, it will call this function with this argument. And so when I request uh, mine.get network.ip adders for a series, uh, it will return the list of IP addresses. Quick question for you. Is um, the grain named environment the only or best way to differentiate environments? Um, how do you set your environment grain? Do you have a customization script on your hand? You know, when do you set that? I will bring this over. When I was messing with this stuff originally, I learned that there are some great shenanigans you can do. Does Control Plus actually work in the console? Control Plus is an equal sign. Yeah, that, that was Control. Don't you worry. All right, is that a little better for you guys? Yeah. Close enough? Yeah. All right. Totally did that. You know, I you need to check the box that says allow anyone to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I typed that password. So, uh, with the with salt, you can actually use the grains command to inspect and modify your grains. So, uh, in this case. It's like every 30 minutes. It refreshes whatever commands you've defined. Uh, but in this case, I'm, gonna, I'm going to read assign the staging host to a different environment. So uh, because I'm lazy and don't want to type in the full host name, I know staging.star is going to get it. I do a grains.setval. the non-existent staging2 environment. And so if I hop over,
it has now, in my Etsy salt grains, modified the environment setting. So uh, when I initialize a new machine, uh, and I have something also in the repo for that, uh, when I initialize a new machine, I have a script that I run. Uh, in Linode, I've created a uh, one of their deployment scripts. But for Amazon, I have this AWS host template. Uh, I cut and paste this in when I'm creating my Amazon host. And all I have to do is go up to the top and edit my short name to whatever the uh, the first part of the host name is going to be. And it goes out. Uh, it sets the host name and Etsy host name, uh, loads it so that it's part of the local, the actual running environment, and then uh, sets the minion ID, runs the in, runs install salt. Oops, got to fix that. Uh, and then it adds my domain. Uh, this is one of the big things. Installing salt and this are the two things that make auto registration work. Because I'm running in a VPC where uh, I think that should actually be happening for me, but I'm not sure. Uh, but getting those details all taken care of puts it in a state so that it tries to resolve the short name salt to find its salt master. And when it does, it starts trying to register. And so all I have to do is do a salt key dash A in the host name. And then I start doing the salt commands at the command line to set the environment and start appending roles. So, so you set the environment in this install salt script? Or you set it no. I go to the master. Okay. And yeah, I, I go to the master and just do a. Uh, grains.append in this case I'm adding the role other app to my list of roles so uh, but I, I do all of this stuff with salt so I don't actually have to log into the machine and then I can simply call a state dot high state and it pushes everything that is now applicable so uh, the next thing I would actually like to go over is uh, I'd like to demonstrate uh, how the how I make use of the mine in some places. <coughs> so I'll look at HA proxy. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is I kind of have a, uh, a header here where I'm pulling lots of things out. I'm initializing my variables, so I'm getting my environment name. Uh, I'm fetching my uh, environment from pillar. And then uh, mesapp env is the, uh, is the actual, that's the mesapp key. I just isolate that because I frequently use it. And then mesapp web is where the interesting stuff starts happening. If we come down here, uh, this is how a salt mine get query works inside of one of your templates. Because you do a mine.get, and then you do a, uh, a selector in the format. I'm actually using the compound ex uh, expression form, so I can do. I can match against two different grains at once because I need to find out everything that is associated with a particular environment and distinctly everything that's associated with a particular role. And in this case, since I'm working on my load balancer config, I really do not want to put uh, host names in here. I learned a valuable lesson about HA proxy. If you put a host name in HA proxy and the host name does not revolve, resolve at the time HA proxy starts, HA proxy will not start, and you will not have packets. And that caused about five minutes of downtime once. And then I figured out how to make sure that I uh, only ever deploy 
uh, resolved IP addresses. So in this, I am using a uh, string format to insert the environment name. But from here, we end up with a, uh, I believe it is a dictionary object. So I'm able to iterate over it and unpack the uh, key and the value of name and IP list. And I just write out a line uh, with the name and the first IP address in the IP list as my uh, HA proxy config. So that config actually expanded out to this. So I'm able to give the servers names that are unique and helpful. It resolves their IP addresses to whatever they happen to be in the Amazon environment. And uh, we set a cookie for uh, session stickiness that just happens to be, the value happens to be the IP address. It's also probably a good idea to turn that into a hash or something so that you're not actually exposing information about your environment. But at the same time, a random IP address is usually not that useful to anyone. So uh, finally, I wanted to open up the environment map that this configuration is able to, uh, to push out. wherein it uh, creates a page per environment. If we go to the Amazon environment, we're able to see on each of the web hosts, we have a micro WSGI server, and we have an Apache server serving static assets. And then we have, on two of the hosts, they have the load balancer role, so they are also acting as HA proxy hosts. Uh, in Amazon, I still run HA proxy behind the ELB, because HA proxy allows me to do uh, actual path-based routing of my things in my app. And it's easier to drive the config from something like Salt and Jenkins. And just, you know, I, I set up my uh, ELBs as SSL terminators and just put my limited set of uh, HA proxy machines behind them so that Amazon's actually handling my forward-facing redundancy. So I don't have to do DNS round robin and risk having that degrade just because one of my hosts went down. So uh, this is the part I'd like to really open this up so that anyone who would like to have some questions answered about particulars of how the configuration is put together can ask those. Uh, anyone have anything? Yes. And then you're spinning up by hand off your, um, your Amazon host, figuring them from your salt mask with your with the grains to the environment. And then they're self configuring with the salt mine to know their own IPs. They, well, the IPs are DHCP assigned by Amazon, but they, they know their neighbor's information based off of the salt mine. So. Uh, in my environments, there is also the, the step of I have not automated putting them into uh, Route 53, which handles my uh, environment DNS. Uh, I, I have very much a philosophy of automate the things that are going to happen very, very often, and don't worry about filling up all your automation with things that you're going to do once a month. Yes. Uh, I actually, let me open up that part of the configuration. So everything that is driven on a per environment basis is in the environments folder. So for instance, map is that environment map we were just looking at. 
where environment HTML and index HTML are both uh, driven based off of querying the mine. And if we come back here and go to Jenkins, we have uh, a properties file that has our list of environments and a .sh file per environment that has all the definitions for those environments. So what happens uh, with this is anytime I've really deployed a new machine, I need to make sure I run salt against the Jenkins host so that on the Jenkins machine, the environment.sh has every host I need to SSH to and deploy. Out of the salt mine. So uh, if we, here I'm actually, I'm iterating over the uh, environment list to generate the environment name.sh file per environment. And so I'm just passing in the environment name so that config file can fetch that information. You're not configuring your Jenkins job stuff until you that. Yes. Yeah, I. Yeah, that's yeah, like I've got a couple of things that are managed. Like I've got, if something in Jenkins is so set that I'm really not modifying it that much, aside from to add something to a list, I will push push it down with this Jenkins scripts uh, directory. So all of these get installed into varlib Jenkins, and. Uh, no. Yeah, like the closest thing to having Jenkins manage that is this find artifacts script, which is called by a Jenkins job that simply does that as its one line thing that it does. But other than that, uh, all the Jenkins stuff is. Uh, so, do you have one more question? So, you guys have a very complicated Jenkins script there. Do you find like, when you first start interacting? I've, only, I've been the only one really modifying it ever, and it doesn't change that often anymore. Like you, you have a whole bunch of changes while you're developing it, and then maybe a month goes by and you realize, oh, I need to tweak this little thing because something's changing for a version level. So you're using your GitHub, your Git repository to kind of back that up, and you're supposed to match exactly where that script I have a uh, Jenkins job that runs that backs up my Jenkins job configs. And I, I do that because I would be very, very, very sad if my Jenkins server just disappeared one day. So once a day, the whole thing gets zipped up and sent up to S3. So that if the whole thing got nuked, I would be able to recover. Uh, and I speak a little more towards your architectural workflow from the inception of a new system where you're deploying the salt. Yeah. Well, are you speaking of I'm adding a new host to a cluster, or? So let's take the, you're, you get a request from the business, the business needs you to scale out one of your web server environments, and my assumption is that you've written state files for some of the core feature sets that you're going to be controlling. You talked about user roles, you talked about um, different uh, patching repos, and different things like that that you can figure in state files. Right. Um, and then kind of the workflow where once you've deployed that server and run all your state files and used it to get into that, uh, I guess, golden template image, uh, where you start deploying code and where that handoff is with so, Jenkins and through, and then maybe a little bit more into the deployment process and, and you know some of those things more along the lines of when a deployment goes wrong, how do you roll back and handle those with Jenkins. If I could add to that, uh, if you could talk a little bit about why you decided to use Jenkins to get into those instead of I particularly, that one's the easiest one to answer. Uh, I use Jenkins for the deploys because I really, really want an audit log. And when I run salt, my the results of my salt command are lost to the scroll back buffer. I mean, I can scroll back, but 
uh, with Jenkins, I can come over here to deploy MezApp and I can say, okay, well, I was developing this. This is the last one that failed on me. And I can look down here and I can say, why did this fail on me? What's the last thing it said before it died? And I had a bug in my script. So uh, my deploy that I tried to do on uh, whatever time that was the other day or last week, seven days and 18 hours ago, it ended because I had a shell script problem in my deploy script. Yes. And I'm able to see that I am the one that started this deploy. At work, we have multiple people who might run a deploy, so we can actually step back through the history. We can see who ran it. We can see exactly what artifacts they were pushing. And the only thing that's left is uh, another tool that I'm still working on that actually records the history of what artifacts are currently deployed. So I can say, not just look through the Jenkins stuff, but actually get a good snapshot of, OK, at this time, what was running? So uh, I believe we are short on time, but I'm actually just going to run through and finish doing a deployment of another host. This suddenly doesn't matter as much when you know it's going to automatically uh, configure to your, your salt master. Uh, the previous question, uh, what, what kind of... Uh, so just kind of stepping through your workflow on your business use cases for salt and then the handoff of salt and salt jail Okay. So uh, basically, I, I, when it comes to deciding what I'm actually going to manage with it, uh, it comes down to what applications are business critical. Like, if it really matters that we know what went wrong when this application uh, didn't deploy correctly or went down, we want it to be managed by salt so that we know that, uh, that human error didn't take it down, and we want it to be managed deployed with Jenkins. And uh, I think we are fast running out of time. If you'd like to come chat with me, yeah. uh, you're welcome to. Uh, but I think we should let everyone go so they can get to their next talks. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed what you found. <laughs>